Okay. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. First of all, welcome to the HKDI Master Lecture Series today. My name is Ho Tech, and I'm the fashion archivist here at the Hong Kong Design Institute. Um, today's topic is fashion for future, and it's going to be divided into three parts. Okay. For the first 15 minutes, we're going to have two amazing speakers sharing their thoughts. It will then be followed by a 30 minutes panel discussion, which we welcome our audience to leave your questions for our speakers in the webinar Q&A. Okay. Before it begins, please allow me to introduce our two honorable speakers for today. They are Julian Roberts from the School of Material at the Royal College of Art. Julian is a fashion designer who has shown 12 collections at London Fashion Week and won the British Fashion Council's New Generation Award five times. And today, he's going to talk about the development of his subtraction cutting practice from 1998 until now. And our second speakers, we have Nabil Nael, the course leader of MA Fashion Design and Technology, Women's Wear at the London College of Fashion, which I will introduce him more a bit later after the first sharing. Without further ado, I would first like to welcome Julian to deliver his sharing today. Thank you, Julian. Thanks very much. Um, hi, everyone. Thanks for coming to listen to us, um, wherever you are in Hong Kong or the world. Thank you very much to HKDI for inviting me. I've enjoyed visiting the college since 2016. I've always loved working with your students and staff. Thank you also to Nabil Nayal, who is showing some important work today. It's an honor to be in your talented company and presenting alongside you. I'm going to start with a screen share. I'm going to be showing all sorts of things, and some of it I'm going to be ad-libbing through, and some of it I'm going to be reading a few notes from. Thank this you, one's done live. Today I'm going to be taking you on a whirlwind tour of some of my subtraction cutting work since leaving college in 1995 and reflecting on how this practice is shaped and extended by human contact and interaction and how through teaching it has enabled me to encourage people in faraway places to unite and engage in risky experimental fashion practices. In this presentation I'm going to be showing you multiple examples of my free cutting fashion and video work and focusing on the benefits of shared exchanges of fashion and textile knowledge. Rather than solely focusing on selling products and developing brand exclusivity, which is more commonly recognized as the modus operandi of an aspiring fashion designer. My work with subtraction cutting is focused on encouraging new designers to be far more open about how they make clothes, revealing the secret processes of construction and inviting more beneficial exchanges which value craft community. And this story begins with some of my early MA work, which I made at the Royal College of Art, where I studied fashion menswear at a time when tailoring was becoming deconstructed and subverted from its conventional uniform. My obsessions at the time were about softness and structure and learning how to create inner layers through hand stitching. But this happened through observation, watching skilled tailors work and sculpt the cloth through physical interaction. The warm human hand of the maker was the tool that helped me develop my own cutting methodology and seek connection to textiles through proximity of my body to the cloth and through the rich experience of touch. I was also very, very interested as a student in the notion of drawing and the idea that actually cutting itself is a form of drawing, a drawing that the scissor follows. Um, usually in design, we start with a fashion illustration. That was the conventional way that I was taught when I was at college. And we then had to follow that through this thing called pattern cutting, through the process of then sewing and manufacturing, sampling the garment. But for me, um, I found this quite limiting because although I was very fascinated in detail, I was very fascinated in cloth, particularly in forensic detail of how the cloth was sort of formed, whether it was knitted or woven. Um, I found it very limiting to start with a drawing. I wanted to instead go straight into 3D and to work in a way where I'm not really following a design, but rather that the design is something that's being sort of chanced upon, something that maybe comes at the end of the process rather than at the beginning. Though I did really enjoy drawing, I, I really enjoyed doing very large drawings at a time when portfolios were shrinking 
uh, in the time when I was at college, we didn't have digital portfolios like you might have now. And so we had physical portfolios, everything was analog. And um, so at a time, at the time, everyone was shrinking their portfolios to make them more portable, more easy to carry. So I really like going the opposite direction. And this is something I've often done in my studies is to, you know, when I'm given a brief is to sometimes push the parameters of it to try and think if what I've been told to do, therefore, maybe how can I perhaps extend that to make it more of a creative and personal experience? So um, I made my portfolio very large, very big drawings, and they were far more expressive. But of course, that made my portfolio exceptionally heavy as well, because it was uh, you know, it had to contain lots and lots of very large drawings. But the large drawings allowed me to really extend outwards and get a sort of more human feel for the shapes I was creating. So I studied women's wear at college and then I did a men's wear MA, uh, these two kind of gender specific uh, titles for clothing, which I don't really follow so much now. I'm really just a maker of clothes. It's not, gen it's not really a gendered experience, uh, the pattern cutting that I experience now and teach. Um, in my collections then that followed, uh, it, this is some examples of it here. Um, it was really just about trying to find my groove, trying to experiment, trying to uh, use cutting as a tool for finding new shape and form, new designs. And these are some of the collections I worked on, I think 12 of them across London Fashion Week and some were shown in Paris, uh, some were in a collaboration. I worked with a uh, uh, Chinese, uh, well, British born Chinese designer called Sophie Chi who's a textile designer who's very talented and together we uh, did some interesting work on textiles for one of our labels called Julian and Sophie and so it's a series of different collaborations that was really just based on experimental fashion and of course you get a lot of press and publicity at fashion shows uh, it generates always huge amounts of, of uh, headlines and uh, questions asked you and images walls of photographers at the end of your catwalk and then backstage papping you and asking you many, many questions. So I found this experience quite strange because I didn't really recognize myself in the way that my work was being described in the media. As a new designer, I thought I hadn't really established my ground yet, that I was being compared to other people and uh, put into a category, a conceptual category as a person who's thought about things through their design. And so I found this a little bit limiting. And, and so I've always tried to try and escape these things to not believe that press and to try and find ways as a designer to keep my audience on their toes. I became very interested in video throughout my uh, studies as a student. So back in as far back as 92, I was making videos for early on in my, in my uh, time at college. And this was at a time before digital video like you have now. Uh, we were using big, huge cameras and analog tapes, and it was quite a clunky process um, uh, editing, editing work. But it was very important to me as a way of projecting my work large. That allowed me to stand in front of it and talk, and I was quite shy and nervous about talking about my work, so it helped me get over those fears. But it also allowed me to show the process of my work, how it was made, the way it moved, the way it actually functioned on a body, not just statically in a static photo or on a uh, sort of frontal view, which is often focused in on when we're designing and taking pictures and uh, making lineups of our work. Um, I wanted to really try and get into the process of how the work was made and to then use video as a way of projecting it large so the audience can see it. So this continued also through my shows in Fashion Week. I used, I've always used video as a way of, of showing the work and, and documenting it. And uh, now, of course, these days you all have video in your phones. You can do digital editing in ways that uh, are very uh, uh, interactive and able to sort of show them and transmit them across the world for others to see. And it's a very, very important shared experience for fashion, uh, the link between fashion and video. And this is a show on the right hand side at the Natural History Museum in London, a big 150 square foot, uh, well, 150 foot tall um, image video image uh, that was during London Fashion Week that allowed a wider audience participation. So the VIPs were at the front with their quick neck looking up at the uh, video. But of course, it also involved the public, those who were further back across the road or passing by, walking their dogs and cycling and things like that. They were able to be involved too. And that was very important for me as a way of trying to sort of widen my audience beyond a select exclusive crowd that is often involved in fashion shows. Now, during these times where we've been separated from each other and there's been 
pandemic lockdowns around the world, uh, I have uh, been very lucky enough in many ways to respond to that by inventing a label. And that label is harks back to the original label I had at Fashion Week, uh, which was called Nothing Nothing. And that launched in 1999, the first season of Spring Summer Zero Zero, the beginning of a new millennium. And I called it Nothing Nothing as a nice empty type, en empty and anonymous title. And I showed under that title for five seasons and then I dispensed with it. I actually sold the label on eBay for one pound with all my trademark and patterns as a way of sort of uh, getting rid of it and escaping what the media was thinking and writing about me in order to invent a new label called Julian and me and question mark me and an unknown audience of collaborators and i still think of that as being my main sort of way of working i collaborate with others i like particularly with students my teaching is a form of collaboration and i like to involve them in how i work now during the pandemic times uh, i have a partner called marie bendeliani i'll be showing you some of her works for this presentation too because we work together she's based in the republic of georgia and we were separated by these, the pandemic and decided in this time to start sharing work and to bring, uh, to uh, make work around our bodies because we were working on basic kits. We were at home, you know, during lockdown times, we kind of had to work in much more reduced uh, situations, uh, not having all the equipment and things that we need at hand. I didn't have a mannequin dummy to work on, I had to use my own body. Um, I had to use a very simple domestic sewing machine very small space that I was also sleeping in and teaching from and in within that space create work and I wanted it to link to Marie's work as we were separated from each other and to do that I sent her parcels of material that I'd gathered uh, from my travels off cuts and end of roll materials uh, fa fabrics that fascinated us and together we kind of began to create collections together and uh, this was a wonderful experience of just sort of bringing us together. And it was a very positive experience in many ways that wouldn't have existed without this pandemic, where through uh, digital means, we were able to unite and to come together and share experiences and try to, you know, keep connected. After 10 months, we were very lucky to then go to Paris and to uh, make a little collection together. Uh, this is some examples of that. I'll show you a little video version of it so you can see it in movement. Um, I will talk over the top, but it might, I don't know what the sound will start like, but um, as I'm doing this live, uh, let's see. So whenever we make clothes, we video them to put them on the body and experience them in the round and try to experience how they feel in movement, test them out, take photographs too very useful for lookbooks and for trying to engage others in the work you're making. And all of these pieces are one-offs. They don't follow a drawn design, they move straight into 3D. We don't know what they're going to look like until we move through the process of construction. And that process of construction is called subtraction cutting, which is a technique of cutting that I invented and have taught in 36 countries around the world and uh, share with others through a free book called Free Cutter, which anyone can download from my website. It's uh, always been available, always been free, and always will be. And it just allows people to participate in these types of cutting so that I'm not just trying to sell a product to them, a dress, on a, uh, my collaborator here, Marie, who helped me make them, but we're also trying to sell the way it's made and not just sell it in fact, but try and pass it on so that others can try it out. And if you want, they can try it out for free and they can be involved in it. And the benefits of that are that they then know the process. It's not hidden from them, but they are, they can do it themselves. You can have a go and actually maybe you can transform it. You can do it in a different way. You can bring some of your own life to it and make it your own. And uh, what I find is that when people know about how a garment is cut, then they respect it more and they covet it more. They, they want it for longer in their lives. It's not fast fashion. It's something that they want to uh, keep in their wardrobes and return to at different parts of their lives. And uh, so all of these people, all of these garments uh, have uh, found different people in the world to become their owner. And we didn't know who that was at the beginning. Louis and I had to make these garments together 
We made nine dresses together in Paris in a week. Uh, went and bought a sewing machine, went to a little apartment, made these dresses together. And they use every part of the cloth, so there's no waste. There's a zero waste methodology where there is no... The idea of waste is that it doesn't really make sense. You, every part can potentially be used somewhere, either within the garment or within the next. And uh, it's a very intriguing way of working. Julianand.com is where you can download a free copy of my um, uh, my free cutting book if you want to learn some yourself and also see different videos and things like that that we do. So after that, we then work on making lookbooks because uh, the next stage is let's engage the world in this work. So we make lookbooks. We use a thing called Padlet, which is a shared uh, to online tool where we can both input images to it put them into order and then invite others to come and see the work and to uh, maybe if they want to buy it, to collect it. And that then allowed us to find uh, places for our work. This is some of the spaces we're working in. So this is the little room that's actually in the room next door because I'm in my dad's uh, flat. He's retired, he's 78 this year. And uh, during the lockdown times, I've been here with him, uh, looking after him and also teaching from this space and, and also uh, uh, making uh, garments with Marie and this looks like some crazy game of twister or something where you might put a foot or an arm in one place and, and or maybe some sort of dance floor. These are all the subtractions, the bits we remove which we then reinsert back into the garment and we use these wonderful fabrics which are called wax uh, Ankara prints which are used across the continent of Africa particularly um, we found some very useful ones from Nigeria and uh, these became the cloths that we wanted to use because they were very positive, very vibrant. And at a time of separation and a time of worry because of the pandemic, uh, the COVID pandemic, we wanted to try and find ways to lift each other's spirits. We found some stores that were interested in our work. This is a store in Berlin. And this is some of the work that we then made in response. This is Marie in her work. She uses her body in a different way to mine. I'll show you some examples of that because our bodies are very important to the way that we make work the way that we measure work. After making work, we also want to take it to others. So we also developed a series of online classes where we could teach subtraction cutting to uh, bigger audiences and involve them. We also did a series of free lectures, which we called um, free cutting lectures, uh, so that we could try and reach out to students who were separated from their colleges and different colleges around the world and separate from each other, because students you know, were uh, obviously weren't in the same places, as you all know, uh, we had to sort of find ways to reunite them. And so we used our lectures as ways to do that and also as ways to teach, allow people to practice, to uh, get making, to find some excitement in the process of construction. So a little bit about how I came to develop some of these methods called subtraction cutting. Um, I have a thing called dyspraxia. Dyspraxia is a kind of dyslexia. A, a, a spatial dyslexia for myself. I get lefts and rights muddled up uh, and opposites. Up, down, on, off, left, right, I get very easily muddled. Just the terms, the words. I obviously know where things are. I never get lost. I'm very spatially aware. Uh, but I get the terms muddled up. And when I was learning pattern cutting, this is a big problem because I, people say the left side, the right side, inside, outside, centre front, centre back. These terms get thrown at you a lot when you're making garments. And so I became a bit muddled up in the way that I learned cutting. And, um, the, and the instructions I was given to, you know, to, by teachers. And so I, in time, I just developed my own methodology that I call subtraction, which is a spatially disorientated form of pattern cutting, where sometimes the left ends up on the right, the back ends up on the front, and the inside ends up on the outside. And that's because a three-dimensional shape is continuous all the way around, a bit like a Klein flask. It has continuity in all directions and uh, like much human beings do too. And so um, I developed these methodologies and I'll show you some of the work that I do whilst creating it. This is a studio in Brighton where I sometimes work out different kinds of studios. I hot studio usually, I don't have a studio open all the time. And I work in black and white in order to follow the cloth to follow its orientation, to find out how does the front end up on the back? How does this left bit go on the right? By putting it into black and white, it allows me to kind of chart that process. I view the pattern from above, from an aerial angle, looking down, and I look at the negative space between the shapes. Uh, these are some sort of examples of how I use drawing. I will often sort of chart out what I think is going to happen, 
or I deconstruct the shape afterwards to find the pattern, the flat pattern. I actually am working a lot in 3D and through a process when I'm making it where I don't quite know what the outcome is going to be. And then I will deconstruct the shape afterwards, uh, reverse engineer it to find what the flat pattern was and also how it joins, how certain negative spaces might join together. And I practice widely because it's only through practice that you learn and hone a technique and develop a sort of an understanding of what can be done or what cannot be done. Sometimes failures happen. Sometimes failures are actually the best things because they teach you something new. I do this on stage a lot, and uh, there's a little graphic on the right hand side of me in front of a large seating plan. And that's me in a little fetal position on stage with a big piece of fabric with holes in it. Sometimes how I might feel, I might feel a bit daunted in front of a large audience. And I've had to overcome my fear of public speaking by being able to uh, demonstrate what I do to large audiences. And that also continues in digital ways through uh, online teaching too. This is actually the last time I was in Hong Kong in 2017, I think it was. Um, uh, I've done some online activities with the college, but um, we came together and we created a series of dresses and uh, it was fantastic and it happened quickly. And all of these pieces were made in just a few hours with no design drawing beforehand. And all of them are just variations on a theme. This is another collaboration in, uh, in Australia at somewhere called the Geelong Fiber Forum where I worked for a week and this is uh, also involves drawing and painting, uh, uh, gestural abstract drawing, um, and on the right hand side, a dress made at London College of Fashion, uh, where I do a series of short courses and take people on very sort of experimental journeys through the construction process. These are some prototypes made in Toronto at Ryerson University. And again, they're little variations on the theme where you make, you take the technique I might teach and just by tweaking it, adjusting it, making small changes, it makes quite large changes around the body of geometric form. And all of this is just formed by negative spaces, holes that the body travels through. So this is me often when I'm demonstrating, I have to get inside these things, I have to perform in front of an audience, I have to show them both the outside, the inside, different vantage points that we might look at the garment, not just a frontal view, but all the way around and also this inside view that happens within a garment. And this idea that the nature of joining negative spaces can create very unusual outward form. I also do deconstruction. So this is me with Marie doing a deconstruction in a place called Catretti in Georgia, uh, where in front of an audience, we're teaching them not step by step, but actually we're teaching them backwards. We take a garment that's ready made and we deconstruct it apart. And that allows me to reuse a piece that I've already made, a prototype, a toile garment, can be taken apart and we can learn it backwards by taking it backwards through steps of deconstruction. And uh, it's very good for teaching audiences who don't have sewing machines, um, who don't have all the equipment and want to learn it in a different direction. And uh, it's always interesting trying to consider if you are, if you have a methodology, if you want to teach it to somebody else, how can you take them through that process? Can you take it through them in a forward direction? Can you take them in a backward direction? Can it, can it, in fact, can you allow people to learn in various ways according to their abilities and how much time they have? Um, there's this uh, book I'm off, I was reading at a time when I was traveling by Umberto Eco called On Ugliness. And there's this one little comment in it, beauty is boring. And it always stuck in my mind because when I do use paintings and drawings, I, I tend to um, be very abstract with them and very messy. And I do these very large gestural drawings. I use it as a way to not just document the work, but also to loosen my limbs, a bit like a sort of a yoga or a stretching that you might do before an activity. I like to use it to stretch my limbs and to be quite bold and, and to also make garments that are hollow. They don't have a head, they don't have arms, they don't have legs, because that allows me to turn them on their side, to look at them upside down, to reorientate them, because that allows that design or that drawing to perhaps be useful in suggesting something else. Maybe it suggests you upside down a collar shape, or maybe it suggests something quite different from what it is that you're actually drawing. And that is an observational drawing of a dress. Maybe it becomes something different in the way we view it. Uh, when I am making garments, I often don't know whether they're gonna be good or not, or whether I like them or not, but I work in multiples. So I make many of them and I hang them up and I return to them at a time when they, when, um, Having had a bit of time away from them, I can sort of complete them. I can find out what's wrong with them. 
I can make them more perfect by having a bit of time away from them. And I find by working in multiples, that's, that's how I'm able to do so. I also sometimes draw my eyes closed. So it's more of an emotional drawing of what does the dress or the garment I'm making feel like? And that's feel like to my body. So I, it's almost like shaking out anxieties and, and uh, joys and, and feelings within the body. And this is a kind of drawing that if you do before you then go and pattern cut, it can then make your lines more fluid, more, uh, more kind of gestural, more like the human body. And that's very useful for uh, improving garment construction drawing. In the studio, I also collect lots of images and often as students, you often are told to collect lots of inspiration. And we often think, what is it for? What is we have, you know, what does this thing mean? And that you often have to spend time with it. So I'd like to make single page sketchbooks rather than a sketchbook you have to turn the page of or having it all buried in your laptop or your computer in lots of folders and files. I like to put it on a big sheet so that I can see it, so that it's present. And I just simply have it there and I start working. And I put up some empty hangers, which is the absence of work that's going to be created. And I start to make and I just have it there to remind me of its presence. But it's also portable. I can also take it down and take it to other places. And slowly over time, this inspiration rubs off on me. It kind of changes my mood. It has certain things within it, like color, that's very emotional and very important, and which I try to color match so that I could then take out and find these materials in the world. And in time, this influences me. And I always encourage people to gather prolifically, gather lots of things, anything that touches you, and to then um, or influences you in some way and then to just spend time with it, put it up so you can see it, so it reminds you it's there and then get painting and drawing and see where it leads, get constructing, get making, get uh, being a bit messy perhaps and seeing what your limbs and your body suggest through the process of construction and making. And I do this not just myself but with students, uh, I would do big drawing classes where I try to get them to unite around the making of work uh, to do drawings together and bring them into a place and to view them in different directions, to reorientate them. So if you feel you're not a good drawer or you haven't done a good drawing, look at it upside down. It might suggest something interesting or better to you. Now, when I'm working with Marie, we offer, she too uses drawing in this very interesting way that she senses, she centers herself within it. And this is her drawing according to her body. And she makes garments around her body and then draws how the garment feels to wear. So it's a different kind of design. It's not a design drawing on a figure. It's a drawing that is about the feeling of the dress. But she also draws upon her body. So her body becomes a canvas. So she hasn't got a bit of material for sleeve. She'll draw it on instead. So we can, sometimes being limited by material, we can actually sometimes use our bodies or draw upon ourselves, or we can respond to the garment through drawing. And this is some of her wonderful practice where drawing has become integral and she measures according to herself and there are different moods each day and we cut therefore differently. And uh, it's important to think of drawing as being, uh, having different approaches and being used in different ways through the process of design. We also kind of paint upon our own bodies and then make impressions into cloth so that um, we can actually, um, use our bodies to kind of guide the cutting process and then to cut around it. And this is me cutting a dress for Marie uh, that was impressed from our bodies. And then I made a kind of a tool that was based upon Marie that, uh, because she was absent at the time, that I could use as a sort of referential tool for making that particular dress or garment. And this is something that's kind of important to how we practice and how we make things and, and how painting and drawing becomes a guide for us in the making process. So this idea that sometimes um, you can make a tool um, or you can make your own process or your own way of thinking and base it upon something physical. I'm going to tell you a little story uh, that sort of relates to the collaboration I had. It's called the Timo Lost Luggage Trouser. This is Timo. He is a very tall person and he uh, is a, um, he works with a, uh, he collaborates with a, a very amazing uh, academic and cutter called uh, and designer called Holly McQuillan. They have a book out called Zero Waste Fashion Design. And Holly invited us to Massey University. And uh, we both traveled around the world uh, on an airplane to uh, uh, 
participate in a collaboration and Timo's luggage got left behind in the airport and so he didn't have anything to wear. They offered him my clothes, but he was far too big and tall for my clothes. So we decided that we'd start making clothes for Timo as a start of our collaboration. So I decided I'd draw around Timo to get an understanding of his shape and scale. And so this is me drawing around Timo in order to make a tool, because you must think of the pattern as a tool. And we can make our own tools and our own measures and our own rulers, um, which might help us through the process of construction. So I decided I, rather than make Timo a whole garment, I'd make him a fragment of a garment. I made him a sleeve. And here's Timo in the sleeve, in his Qantas Airline t-shirt, who'd lost his luggage. And here's Holly in the background being involved in the collaboration. And this ruler here is uh, arm, a ruler for an arm was used to make the sleeve. And then Holly takes the sleeve and starts to make a zero waste uh, coat or jacket, a very abstract piece from it, very interesting collaboration I'm now having with Holly. But Timo gets bored and so he takes the sleeve and he puts it on his leg upside down. And seeing it on his leg upside down, it reminds me of a sculpture by uh, a sculptor called Umberto Boccioni. And it has a lot of freedom of movement on it. And I decide it looks much better on a leg than on a sleeve. So I forget that I'm making sleeves and I now re realize that I'm making a trouser. And that trouser was the first piece of our collaboration between myself and Timo called the Timo Lost Luggage Trouser. And this is it on its side, lying down. Doesn't look anything like a normal trouser with lots of holes and spaces that were because we were trying to not waste material, we were trying to make zero waste pieces, we reused either within the garment or within subsequent garments so that everything became useful and uh, used in the process of design. So you cut a left and a right leg. The spaces actually join up and link together. Holly takes the circle of spaces that I'm subtracting and uses them for collars so there's no waste there. And then Timo at the end of the process has a pair of trousers on his legs that have a lot of feeling of sort of movement like the sculpture that Umberto Boccioni uh, created that has this dynamic feeling of movement that makes you perhaps want to move. And so this then moves on to a, a, may, a way of cutting that I call crazy legs, where you might paint patterns, you might use a liquid medium to create the cloth because then it will have more fluidity to it. And it allows for a more abstract approach to construction uh, that creates garments that um, we can't really think of it in advance. We have to sort of go through the process of constructing and making them. This is me actually making one here. Uh, I just take a ruler, dip some paint in it and very quickly make a tube. At the end of the day, a, a, uh, most garments are just tubes, whether it's a tube for a leg, a tube for an arm, a tube for your torso, a tube for your hips if it's a skirt, a tube for your head if it's a collar. Garments are essentially tubes. They need to be others. We need to pass through them to get through them. So if you make an un unusual tube, maybe it's painted because then it's nice and fluid and has a sort of a rhythm that connects with the body, then maybe from that you might be able to make a more unusual trouser. And I develop this with people who experiment on trousers and we take it through a long process of, of honing it and getting it right on the body and trying to find the movement a physical movement of the body that connects to the person who's wearing it. But it's all to do with holes and spaces and the connection of spaces and how the leg moves, how the body wants to move in it, maybe tested on people, maybe you're tested on a dancer or a gymnast to try and find some dynamic activity within it, to try and shake a leg and see what your leg wants to do. Um, I call it crazy legs because trousers are usually so conventional and straight. And I teach it to students as well as the design teams. I taught it to the design team at Nike at their world headquarters in Portland, Oregon, in uh, Beaverton, and uh, to try and instead make something more dynamic, something that actually could work very well with a sport activity. So these things can always be taken in different directions, whether it's an avant-garde creative direction, or whether it's a very um, ergonomic, um, uh, you know, and, and functional uh, commercial direction, depending on whether you, you know where you want to take that idea, that's where you might want to focus it. But it's all about just loosening this approach to design. And if I'm doing a trouser class, in the same way that Timo put a sleeve on his leg, you can still put you can still put a trouser on your arm or on your head. Find another purpose or uh, outcome for it. This is a garment for a musician called Andrew, and he. Um, 
was a very important person to me who uh, played music live at my first show. And he asked me to make a video for an album he was uh, creating. And uh, so I decided to uh, measure his musical reach and to make some measures according to his body and his posture. And so I made a robot for his body and then including his flowing white hair. And then I cut a hole because I start designing by cutting holes. And this is a hole for his body in the shape of Andrew Poppy and uh, in Poppy red cloth. And then I mend that clothes, that hole closed to make an Andrew Poppy skate shaped scar. And I don't know what this design is going to look like when I'm first making it. I'm just feeling my way through the process. But the first stage is cut a hole. It will then fall onto the shoulder like a, like a poncho. And then it becomes something that I can find a relationship on the body. And then I take it to Andrew on a very empty beach. And together uh, we make a video uh, that is uh, linked to his music. Uh, which then reconnects it back to this process of, of, of making things for human bodies, things that are shaped by humans. I'll end by just showing you a little video that is uh, uh, a little sort of moving version of that. Um, I'm singing while the hunting horns blow. I'm singing while the hunting horns blow There's a lot of huffing, huffing, huffing There's something I could do There's something at the window So all of these different methodologies that I've shown to you today, these different approaches, and I've got more than, because I was working live, I've created even more things I could show you and talk about. Um, it's really just to show how through using your physical body, through touch, through not knowing everything, through allowing risk and experiment and mistake to be part of the process, you can find your own ways of making and um, also your own markets and you can do so in at times of uh, difficulty such as in pandemics and in separations and we can make things in hopeful ways for each other and for different worlds and for different futures so i hope these sort of uh, these approaches uh, are useful and interesting to you in thinking about how you go about making things in relation to yourself for others thank you thank you thank you julian thank you julian Okay, so thank you for the for the interest, very interesting sharing. And uh, now we have our second speakers of today. Nabil Nayal is the course leader of the MA Fashion Design Technology Women's Wear at the London College of Fashion. He's also an award-winning fashion designer who has won many prestigious awards, including the Royal Society of Art Award, LVMH Prize uh, shortlist in 2015, and LVMH Prize finalist in the 2017. His topic today will be in the volatile and ever-changing landscape. How can young creatives find solutions to the problem of the next decades? And he'll be focusing on some of the key attributes and skills that fashion students need to try in the coming years. So now, thank you, Nabil. Hello. I'm Nabil Nayal, and I describe myself as a practice-based designer. My practice has evolved to respond to the demand from international stores from all around the world, which is in collections that adhere to the London Fashion Week and Paris Fashion Week schedules. I've risen through the support of various platforms, such as the British Fashion Council and LVMH Prize. Um, and I currently sit on the Arts and Creative and Economy Advisory Group at the British Council. Alongside my design practice, I lead the MA Fashion Design Technology Women's Wear course at the London College of Fashion. My approach uh, and my vision for the course builds on the conceptual framework I developed during my practice-based PhD, which I completed at Manchester Fashion Institute in 2018. I explored European historical dress and the concepts of disruption as a generative principle in design. Disruption underpins my process as a designer, and I was able to theorize this using concepts from the post-structuralist philosopher Gilles Deleuze. 
I proposed types of subruptions that sit under the umbrella term of disruption. Um, I won't go too much into detail here about this, but just to kind of give you an idea, um, eruption, corruption, interruption, abruption, and eruption with an I are the kind of main uh, subruptions that sit underneath the disruption term. And this is how those three terms apply to my work. I'm going to begin by going back in time, which my work often does. In 2016, at around 2 a.m., I was printing out an image of a Renaissance doublet when my printer ran out of ink. Instead of printing a clear image, a striped and broken image appeared, a mistake or accident caused by owning a bad quality printer and being tired after a long day of research. Instead of throwing the image away, I held on to it because it looked interesting visually. A few days later, I revisited the image and began to interrogate it, to ask it questions such as, why are you important? What are you saying? The more I questioned, the more I learned, and the gaps or stripes were important, and they became even more important day after day. These breaks led to an exploration of eruptions, and then this led to an exploration of the concept of disruption. I take satisfaction from the fact that disruption led to an exploration of the concept of disruption. Fast forward to early 2022, um, and when the UK went into its first lockdown, along with restrictions brought to our everyday lives, my students were suddenly confronted with restrictions in terms of access to all manner of things, ranging from the studio, which had to be closed, materials, which were no longer easily accessible, and access to machinery and technology, which is very, very difficult to come by. Students were confined to what they could achieve in their bedrooms. They were limited by what was available in their kitchens. They were restricted to working with their hands and digital technologies. These limitations were initially greeted with a mixture of frustration and anxiety, but students also saw this as an opportunity to establish meaningful concepts and prototype ideas, testing out creative outcomes. We saw the unorthodox and the unexpected. I'm going to provide two examples um, by two students who were studying with us during our very first lockdown. The first student is Louise, who returned to Sweden during the first lockdown and spent many months reconnecting with nature, re-evaluating the meaning of her work and the direction she was headed towards. This time for pause and reflection allowed her to join the dots, essentially, making connections between abstract ideas and concepts, physical and virtual past and present. Louise's earlier work had explored the archives, specifically the way we store and preserve seeds, plants all around us from all around the world. The idea of unlocking future life in a post-apocalyptic world was important to Louise, and so was and still is the subject of sustainability, which we embed into the course. You can see here an image of an egg that was in mid-process of being dropped to the ground or hurled to the ground, whereupon it shattered into pieces, revealing an inner, something that was inside precious, important. The idea of transformation became very important to Louise. For her, um, prototyping was basically a mixture of paper and wire structures. And Louise was able to very quickly establish her concept of a garment that could be deliberately destroyed to reveal garments hidden within. Each time her customer got bored of their garments, or if the garment was just damaged or worn out, or just, you know, people just kind of thought they want something different, customers could return their garments to Louise, who, basically cut the garment into bits, revealing the shell, much like the egg that we saw before, to expose the inner garment that had been locked away. Louise would be planning and designing future iterations of her garments before the first garment was ever manufactured, and that felt important, that felt significant. It brought about a temporal disruption, revealing hidden designs that were developed years ago, 
and it led to a powerful connection between her and her customer, the garments that they wore, what they bought, and this kind of connection with something that was within, a garment within a garment, that you wouldn't know what it was, what it would become. But you knew that by wearing that garment, by preserving that garment, you were preserving a future message from the designer. You can see how the fire, the process of burning, carried on being important for Louise. So beyond the physical or the physicality of that process, a method that became significant to Louise's process, you can see how the burning in itself provided an aesthetic value to her work. Trying to achieve that aesthetic value also led to really quite interesting draping methods that were about molding and sticking to the body. You see the materials being used are, are not necessarily precious. I mean, they're essentially, like I said before, just paper and wire. They're not necessarily valuable, they're not expensive, but there's a freedom and ease and a, a lack of preciousness that comes with using such materials. And this was the lineup that Louise um, promised and, and then fulfilled with her collection, her master's collection. On to our next student, Juliette Gilbert. Juliet is another example of a student who proved that restriction and limitation was a positive force that allowed her to get the very, very best out of her ideas. Juliet returned to France, um, where she's from, during lockdown and explored the concept of territories, began a journey of introspection and used objects such as, as you can see here, glass, fruits, portraiture, paintings, as stimulus, stimuli for ideas. You can see in the top right image how she sort of plays with this idea of territory and context. So the symbolic pouring of a jug from the painting that is pouring water or water is coming from the jug into a, a wine glass. This idea of playing with virtual and not virtual, real and not real is very important to Louise. Sorry, Juliet. Juliet's commitment to realizing the dramatic silhouette she'd achieved had been, uh, during prototyping was really, really quite amazing. Um, the silhouettes that she was coming up with were really, really exciting. Um, using everyday objects, like I said, things like, for example, lampshades, as you're about to see, but trays from the kitchen, using leather, veg tan leather, to achieve those silhouettes. The ability here of, Louis, of, of Juliet using a whip, but methods of kind of wicker wrapping basketry and creating these quite extreme silhouettes with very, very kind of ordinary everyday objects was, was really amazing to see from Juliet. The lampshade became important to Juliet as well. She explored how it could form silhouettes. And I think it was really quite amazing to see the kind of very radical approach to shape making basically living in the objects that she was surrounded by, putting them in new territories. Juliet was, like I said, very committed to creating these, these shapes in three dimensions. And a lot of this required, like I said, investigations and leathers that were important to her. She contacted an incredible group of people, craftspeople who live and work in Morocco, who specialize in veg tan leathers. Um, and brought the leather back to the UK and worked with a, a friend, um, of course, who was able to support the craftsmanship, the kind of making of the leathers. So it was a collaboration between Juliet and this craft person who was able to help her achieve these quite extraordinary shapes. You can see here the value of drawing as a method that allowed Juliet to communicate her ideas. So she will be the first to admit that she wouldn't necessarily win awards for the most beautiful drawings, but that she was beautiful about these drawings here is, is the ideas that they contain, the kind of creative possibilities that are held within. And the way that, you know, she has been able to successfully communicate ideas, I think is fantastic. And that is what design is about, is the communication of idea, the problem solving that goes with that too. 
the lineup that uh, Juliet promised as well and, and more than delivered on. And in fact, she was so successful with the collection, she now works at Saint Laurent. So what can we take from these insights into these two students? I think the first thing to say is that both Louise and Juliet are incredibly talented students. Um, you know, and I think that credit is due to their ability to kind of bring um, the determination, a drive, a perseverance to make things work despite the odds. But I think they would also support in this idea of, you know, methods such as fat time, which is the first thing I want to talk about, is being really important to the design process. Fat time is a very British word. Um, it essentially is seen as a kind of a yeah, not doing very much, I suppose. And it's often seen as a very negative thing um, in society. But actually, I think it's a really important word to use um, to describe an important process, which is just to reflect, to mess about, to play, to, to take stock of, of the work that we're looking at and to join up new dots, to form new relationships and connections between past ideas and current investigations. And that's what I think both students did really well, but in particular, I think Louise's work shows the success of taking that time to reflect, to look back, to take stock. I think fast time is a really important part of the creative process. I also think that prototyping, low fidelity prototyping is key. Um, by low fidelity, I mean, you know, using everyday materials that are available, um, card, paper, sellotape, wire, whatever you've got to hand. And, and often we were limited, as, as I explained before, in lockdown to what was available in, in the drawer in the office or what was available in the kitchen sink. <laughs> you know, we had to use those ingredients, if you like, to inform um, our thinking, our, our prototyping. And what comes with that, I guess, is a, first of all, it's an accessible thing. It doesn't necessarily have to be an expensive process. It's a more inclusive process but also this lack of preciousness, if you like. You're less precious about something that costs less. You can take those risks, those creative risks that are so important to the creative process, try something you've never done before, and use that to kind of visualize in 3D the ideas that you had in 2D, in drawing, in collage. Try to expand the kind of creative possibility through the, the, the process of prototyping, which I think is so important. Finally, this is one of the things that I think is, is very obvious, but is, is not necessarily discussed much in, in our discipline, but breaking down the kind of very linear approach to design and to, to collections generation. So as we all as creatives, as practitioners, as artists or designers um, know very, very well, you know, you don't see the process really as idea, as research, as design development, as twirling and prototyping and then ultimately an amazing collection. It very rarely works like that. And actually, I think the best way to visualize the process is something like this, which is very, very chaotic, deliberately chaotic, um, subversive and disruptive. You know, you could be starting with a final, if you like, garment that you then reverse engineer into, into thread, into fiber, into the kind of atoms of the garment, if you like, and then redevelop it, unlock new creative potential through design development, through research, through adding and subtracting, through twirling and prototyping, to only go back down again to that atom if you wanted to. So it's never a linear thing. And I, I tend to visualize this as a kind of a constellation of stars and about forming relationships between disparate, if you like, entities, objects, contexts. And I think that's where newness has the potential of really coming through. I think, you know, for me, it's very much about embracing this idea of mistake and happy accident, chance and serendipity. You might, for example, find yourself, as I did a few years ago in a museum, and you open up an archival box only to reveal a taxidermic bat, a dead bat, for example, or a bird that you were not expecting. You know, you might have been expecting a drawing, but you were confronted with something very, very different. Um, you might start developing something in 3D, but accidentally spill paint on your twirls or the garment that you made. 
And maybe you then realise that that was actually the best mistake you ever made. Thank you very much. Hello, I'm Nabil Nayal, and I describe myself as a practice-based designer. My practice has evolved to respond to the demand from international stores from all around the world. Hi. Hi. Hi, both of you. Thank you. Thank you for another interesting sharing by Nabil. Okay, so now we come to our panel discussion section for today. And uh, since time is constrained, I've already collected some of the questions already from my students and also some of my colleagues. So the, maybe I'll start off with a, an, an, an easy one first, I would say. Okay. Uh, I could see that both of you have a rather distinctive uh, style or approach in design. And uh, a student would like to know when you kickstart a new collection or a new design, where do you start? I mean, like, uh, do you start from the pattern construction, like on a dummy uh, with fabrics, or you start with sketching ideas? Maybe Julian? <laughs> Just before I answer that question, I just have to say thanks to Nabil. That was really fascinating seeing the work of uh, both your work and also Louise and Juliet's it's a really fascinating subject you've chosen. And I think towards the end of your talk, you were saying that, you know, it's sometimes not a linear thing. It's not a, what do you start with? This isn't always an easy question because we might start with many different things and we might make a sort of more chaotic or uh, approach to things in quite a deliberate way we're open to that you know we're open to maybe accepting things around us so for myself i would say this idea of happy accidents that sometimes i'm i don't really know where to begin and i don't i need to respond to how i feel at a time and how how the world feels and so i just i might collect colors or i might be sort of receptive to certain things around me it might be music it could be the shapes of things it could be moods and feelings it could be restrictions, um, things I can't get to, you know, things I can't reach. That happened a lot in this lockdown time. Um, and so I, I gather these things and then I allow time to pass because it's I then, you know, they they change through time and 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 I respond to them differently. And and uh, I think through um, different types of drawing and different doing sort of lo-fi things as uh, as uh, also uh, was interesting to see in Nabil's uh, talk and um, by approaching things in a mixture of ways um you might end up with something interesting that actually when you first make it it's maybe not so interesting but when you look at it maybe the next day it's suddenly very interesting so that's why i, don't, I say don't throw things away ever because there's often through a mistake you'll learn something really fascinating so if things just lead on and you trust that process and it, you it will then uh, hopefully results will come if you if you're kind of honest with it I don't know that that's not a straightforward answer because it's not a straightforward question. But no, Bill, sorry for you. Yeah, so I think for me, it's, um, it's I believe in that, as I'm sure Julian will agree with, is that you're, you're always in, in dialogue with what's around you, what's in front of you, what's visible and invisible. There's this constant communication between you and the world around you, I think. And there's a response from that to so that response can be through drawing, it can be through thought, it can be through working with a mannequin it can be working through textiles it can work through materials unorthodox and, and and kind of traditional um but for me i guess my process nine times out of ten and, and i and i know why this is now that i didn't years ago it begins with me sitting in a very specific room in my house being surrounded by very familiar shirts and research that i've always gone back to over the years and I will always, for some reason, when I come to draw, go straight, straight to the neck. I will start with the collar. And that's because the shirt is an important archetype in my work. And I've investigated that at length during my PhD. Um, I'm fascinated with Elizabethan dress. Um, a lot of my research has taken me back to the Renaissance. And so the evolution of the collar, when you, you know, and it's, and it's kind of journey, the journey that it's taken on through, um, through time has always been really interesting to me. And I think that's why 
I tend to gravitate towards that color. But what I take to the color or what I take to that drawing will be different every time because, like I said, you're responding to not only the things that are around you, but you're also responding to memory, to images that um, come into the forefront of your mind at a specific point in time. And it's really, really important to maintain very fluid um, connections and very porous, um, if you like, borders between you and, and life that is going on around you so that you can make sure that you are capturing the absolute clearest um, kind of energy, if you like, of what's what's happening in the world before you. So, I hope that uh, makes sense. Yeah, <laughs> that's great. Right. And uh, another question I want to ask is, you know, in traditional like fashion design course, students will often ask to do research. I'm sure it's a good thing. Like they should do research before they design things, right? And so they will go on and, and look at other designers work. They would go on and look at other runway shows and trend report, et cetera, et cetera. And sometimes I, I, I do find that students may get too inspired by those work and they might imitate or copy those details or style unintentionally. Okay, so the, do you have any tips for, for, for the fashion students, how they could keep their own or develop their own personal style or personal like signature style without being too influenced by the others? Mm. Um, shall I go first, Julian? Yeah, yeah go for it. As I think, I think, first of all, we have to, and I do this all the time, is kind of assess and evaluate the words that we're using to describe the, the creative process. Um, for me, the word inspiration is not a word that I use at all, really, because I think it sort of suggests a lack of commitment to a thing that you're looking at. I tend to use the word informed by, because I think it's really important to commit to whatever it is you're looking at. Um, or researching or exploring or whatever it might be because you will have to have investigated that in depth and then synthesized your findings through your practice. Um, words um, such as themes as well are, are problematic for me because I think that feels uh, like a very dated term and isn't necessarily relevant to fashion now. So I think it's making sure that first of all we come up with the right vocabulary to describe what practice actually is but also not complex language, language that's very simple and easy to understand as well. Um, I think for me, in terms of where you would start and what you would do, I think, you know, it's, it's, it's very tricky and I think it's very difficult for us to kind of lead too much in the creative process. I often try and make sure that students come to us and have a debate with us about what it is they're interested in in broader context as well. So, it's not necessarily when they're coming to us, uh, you know, talking about um, very obvious subjects that might inform fashion. We try to dig a bit deeper and try to get under the idea to, to sort of reveal the issues, if you like, or the, the kind of thing that's bubbling from underneath. And often that is very much a values based subject. Um, and we found with our students, when we get that, that's where the energy comes, that's where the excitement comes. And that's what they really want to talk about. Does that make sense? Great, thank you. Yeah, I'd say. I think uh, just to add to that, just a small thing, I, I just think that, I think when people are researching, they need to be prolific. They need to have a lot of it. And that actually helps it not be focused on any one thing too much. and. I think it's really important to look at other people's work and to not feel that it's going to sort of um, somehow um, over influence you. I think it's good to have understand the context of your work, where it sits in the world. But, um, but when, when you gather a lot and when you gather things perhaps beyond the obvious and beyond your usual experience, then by having that mixture, you, it will combine, it will kind of, it will meld, it will kind of uh, come together in some way. And so it's, it, I think it's important to sort of allow that to happen. And, and I think sometimes students maybe stop too short in not gathering enough. I think the more, the better, and the, the more honest, the better that you can just be responding to things that are really touching you and really intriguing you. And you can always widen your perspective out beyond the local, see what's happening in other places, how are other people, other viewpoints, other vantage points, how are other people doing things? I think that's always really great to look into. And, 
and uh, yeah just i'd say widen out research a lot it's, it's a useful thing lots of it mm, definitely okay thank you and uh, next one will be like um let me choose one okay fashion has always been addressed as a and the wearable art uh it meaning that it's an art piece but at the same time it's also need to be worn on the human body so how do you balance creativity and practicality in your design julie do you want to take that a shot? yeah i mean i just think of it in just a simple way of um i i just think of it in a simple way is that there's art in there in that um i'm always wrestling between is it am i an artist am i a designer i'm both but it's um it's the art is me it's it's where i situate myself in the work while i'm doing it it's it's that connection to processes and memories and and um actions that are part of the making process and so the art is there because that's me making it and um and i consider myself an artist um the design is there because it's for a purpose it's got to be for somebody it's got to function it's got to have you know if i'm not everything i do might be purposeful some of the things i might do might be uh in like in between stages of prototyping that might seem a bit wasteful but I, and if it's ending up with something that's with somebody else then then that's design and i'm really thinking through their needs and not just their needs now but maybe their future needs too of how a garment might sit in their life and that's an that's that's a purposeful activity that i need to, of consideration you know you've got to be empathetic and considerate to others and that's what i like about clothing it, it has that connection to others um that it draws you out into making and meeting people and finding out what is it that you know asking questions about what their needs are so uh, that's the, i'd say that's where those areas of art and design sit for me personally Julian, can I ask you a question in terms of your position? Um, you, you sort of said you, you see yourself as an artist, but also as a designer at the same time. One of the things that I try and battle with is that issue of, you know, is fashion art or is fashion design or what is the position of fashion yeah. as a subject, but also the specific designer, if you like, or a student that might be trying to, you know, navigate this kind of sometimes quite, quite complex terrain. Um, your perspective, do you see art as, um, a field that practices problem solving in the way that design does i think it can um i don't think there are such distinctions I, I mean i'm a bit muddled in having distinctions between things anyway in my thinking and so i'm always sort of interested in sort of the gray areas but it's um i i i see design as being part of art and and art often having design in that it has some structure and some purpose and something that really motivates it and sometimes it can be very very um super detailed and complex a plan that you set out for an art activity or performance so it's i think that the two are sort of interlinked i think i do that a lot as well because i'm i mean i work at the royal college of art and it's a design course within arts and art college and so i always think of it as being within it's it's almost like something it's like um some sort of russian doll it's like a thing within a thing and um i also like it say at the swedish school of textiles they fashion is part of textiles i like the fact that it sits within textiles rather than textiles just being something that's seen as sort of um as some sort of service industry to fashion right so sometimes it's just i like the way that schools put things together and i i um i personally from my experience i tend to think of design as being within art and a, and a kind of an aspect of it um, but I know others wouldn't. But. I mean, I, I'm on the same school of thought as you with that. I think, you know, especially when we're talking about collaboration, cross-pollination, breaking down boundaries, you know, making more mm. or porous between disciplines. I see it as a much more, it's not about the differences, but it's about the similarities. And there are lots of them. I think there are lots of crossovers. And so I encourage my students to see their practice from other, through other lenses, if you like. Yeah. So I completely agree with you on that one. It's very good to know. I'm not on my own. <laughs> it's really good seeing your students going through these what might be seen as very artistic um, processes of like maybe burning something or throwing an egg or or um, you know uh, putting something from an everyday object onto their bodies. That's what might be seen as like where how's that going to play out in any commercial sense or in a design sense, you know? 
but it is it is opening ideas and it's opening new avenues new conversations with things and so i think that's where new markets might emerge or new new products and so it's it's really great that they are not that we don't just focus on let's be commercial all the way through because that's what design is and we need to end up with design i think it's good to uh, allows us to sort of uh, break those boundaries and and test distinctions and do allow things to happen Absolutely. And that's why within our final unit for our students, we have these two very kind of clear options for students to kind of, you know, engage with in terms of their, their creative outcomes. So it could be a much more, if you like, academic um, outcome that's much more about the theory and the philosophy, which obviously I love and enjoy, but also they can go down the, the kind of collection, if you like, as well and do that route, but there still has to be an underpinning of, of theory too. Um, I think it's as well, like I said before, it's that revisiting of the term. So even commerciality, the term for me, is one that needs to be reassessed because commercial or commerciality for me means something that will sell and hopefully sell well. Now, if you're producing, like a lot of my students, pieces that you would never necessarily see on Oxford Street, which is just downstairs, or, you know, Bond Street or whatever it might be, yeah, but it will sell to somebody who's a collector, somebody who is in another part of the world is really fascinated by it. That for me is commercial. That product is commercial and has proved its its worth in terms of sales. Um, but yeah, completely agree with you on that, Julian. I think it's good. That's design, of, though, is too because it's it's yeah. about find, letting the work find its its owner or its collector. Mm -hmm. it, that takes quite a lot of. I mean, sometimes it's lucky and chance. Somebody sees your work and they want it. Other times it's about putting it in the right place and, and so that they can understand it and so they can see it and appreciate it and want it in their lives. And that that is a form of that all requires design too. Definitely. Um, definitely. That's really interesting. I think I find a lot of people as well with my practice, they tend to buy to collect or buy to put on walls. I would never imagine my work on walls. Why would you do that? It's clothes. But okay. people seem to think that's the right place for what I do. So with with students, I sort of say, not customer per se, I mean, they are customers, but it's audience, just to try and broaden it out to who you're looking at as an audience rather than a consumer. Yeah. Um, I'm loving this conversation. Yeah, it's great. It's great. Interesting conversation, which leads to our next question. It's uh, since our topic today is fashion for future, okay, what do you think fashion will become in five years' time? Um, what aspect of the change do you think will be the most obvious? I'm sure there's a, a lot of things has changed just starting from last year. So the, what do you think fashion will become in five years time? You want to go question. I find this a difficult question. So I start talking only because I don't entirely know the answer. So then I, you can end with it. Um, I, I think a lot has changed. In, you know, the pandemic has refocused a lot of things it's i think it's decentralized things a lot there was a lot of attention on sort of london paris milan new york i feel that that isn't quite won't always be so evident i think that i think people are making their connections and sharing work and and uh focuses are going to sort of very much change away from the uh, away from those sort of traditional uh, areas i also think that the link up between technology and you know the way that technology is now being used in the making of garments using 3d uh, modeling and uh, the link to gaming design and that sort of thing is a very fascinating thing that's happening that is allowing other outcomes for design that aren't necessarily all about um wearing on a human body it could be a digital body in a in a game so that's a very fascinating thing and i i am always interested that these things these new grounds are opening up and it and that are maybe that a pandemic maybe something that's actually in a negative time has actually changed the way that communities talk to each other and think about things and and uh, how they go about designing and how they use technology in that process and i think it's all very fascinating even this conversation now that we're just having on you know in, you know in hong kong both of us in different parts of the uk to different audiences around the world people thinking different things from their own perspectives it's a change you know it's a it's a great thing so um i'm thinking things will decentralize a bit from the normal or the more usual sort of uh, focuses of, of uh, capital cities that have become renowned for their sort of fashion influences no definitely and i think just to add a bit more to that i think for me i almost don't want to know what the future holds because my whole thing is about disruption so i trust the process of 
of mistake and accident to kind of guide me and they they are that is my guiding principle is disruption um, but equally i do hope that um and i'm seeing this which is really really good is that we enter a more positive um and more um yeah a much more positive kind of fashion world we see a much more inclusive world when it comes to design i look forward to the day when i was speaking to a friend of mine alison welsh as, you know look forward to the day like she does when we see garments with their labels in them you know designer nabil now or whatever but with also the names of all the other people that contribute mm -hmm. to the making of yeah, like in a film like in a film you know the uh Awesome. It happens in the film industry, you get this long list of credits, but it, in fashion, it's often been just putting forward the one name. Uh, exactly. And that's not really a clear picture of what, how it works. It's all about teamwork, isn't it? It's about. Um, mm, exactly. We can't do it on our own. You know, as running businesses, as, as we know, is, is really, really challenging. You do it with a team of people. You, your, your kind of supply chain is super important as well. So making sure that everybody who is in that supply chain is acknowledged and respected. And that's why I'm hoping we'll, we will see more of, I think, as we go forward in the next five to 10 years or so. Yeah, I think also maybe the breaking down of sort of gender to specific uh, design is, is something that's really sort of, uh, um, it's, it's happening and increasing. I hope it, it sort of, it, it continues because I really like the idea you just have a collection and that collection is for whoever wants to come in and try it out. And that's really exciting. I think much more as a designer who I've been put into categories of, uh, now I'm doing a women's wear course and now I'm doing a men's wear course. It's, I just really like making clothes and I like it for whoever wants to wear them and whoever want, whoever they might be. So, um, yeah, I love that. I completely agree with it as well. Although the course that I work in is called Fashion Design Technology Women's Wear, the, the name Women's Wear is there as almost like um, a kind of a placeholder for lots of other genders that can come along with that. And also the non-gender that comes with that too. And also how people define Women's Wear, um, you know, not necessarily linked to one's um, sex, but yeah. it can also be linked to other things too. So I think I, I look forward to the day where we're not even just talking, we're not talking about that anymore. It's just collection. It's a collection mm -hmm. that's enjoyed and appreciated and worn by people. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I agree with you completely, that Julian. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, both of you. And uh, I think it's about time. So finally, we come to the end of our sharing today. And uh, I would like to face a big thanks again to, to our two speakers today, Julian and Nabil. And uh, Actually, can we get a big round of applause for our speakers for today? Thank you. And uh, I'm sure that sharing today will be beneficial for our audience, especially our fashion students. So thank you again and uh, take care and goodbye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye. Thanks thank a lot you. for the opportunity to chat. Good talking to you, Nabil. Okay, you too as well, Julian. Let's send an email to each other. Yeah, let's do it. <laughs> so I just took a picture at the end because I wanted to have a little souvenir. Oh, I'm going to do the same. Hold on. Yeah, let's do a little screenshot. Bye-bye. <laughs> Take care.